The next speaker coming up here is a good buddy of mine here. Ron Fuller uh, is the network and, in the Network and Security Business Unit at VMware for NSX. Former Cisco employee, Cisco Press author, dual CCIE, and just an all around great guy. So we'll, we'll dive right in. Um, first off, thank you for having me. This is my first time to, to shine Og, so this is pretty exciting to get an opportunity to speak with a group of uh, network operators such as yourself. Um, been some interesting presentations and definitely from my perspective it's been educational just even showing up. So thank you for having me first off. Uh, what we wanted to talk about today was being able to look at how we can do some optimization for vSphere hypervisors that are starting to take advantage of a, a pretty common overlay technology called VXLAN. Any of you, you taking advantage of VXLAN in your networks? I imagine some of you probably have customers that are running VXLAN over your network that you, either you don't know about or it's just transit, right? So what we wanted to talk about was some of the ways that you can um, optimize it for maximum performance from a vSphere standpoint. So I think on a, a, a nerd meter standpoint, this is probably about mid-level geekiness, so not too terribly bad, but not a, not a bunch of just marketing slideware either. So with that, we'll dive right in. And we wanted to level set with the concept of what VXLAN is. So only a handful of people raised their hands, so this probably makes sense to, to review this. VXLAN is really um, kind of an emerging encapsulation technology. To be able to take an IP frame, wrap it into a, a VXLAN uh, UDP packet, and send it across an IP network at, at layer three. This brings us a lot of benefits, and this is why it's becoming much more popular, especially in the enterprise space. It's solving a lot of problems for them. I think the comment earlier today was I'd rather do anything than run a large layer two domain. I think a lot of our enterprise customers are starting to come to that realization too that layer two doesn't scale no matter what I do to it, right? There's been a lot of different technologies that have come down the pipe to be able to try to help solve layer two challenges and they've, done, they've been relatively successful, but it's still at the end of the day, it's layer two. I'd rather have a layer three network that obviously is very robust scales to the size of the internet and beyond and be able to take advantage of that. But the reality is applications still need to have layer two. So how do I marry those two together, to get the benefits of pure layer three, but still provide the layer two transport that I have to have for some of my application requirements, enter VXLAN. VXLAN is an IETF uh, standard or it's a draft standard at the moment that's been contributed to by pretty much all the major players, right? Cisco, Arista, Broadcom, um, VMware, et cetera, have all contributed to it. And the idea, as I mentioned, is it's an encapsulation protocol. And from a VMware standpoint, we can take advantage of VXLAN to be able to do some interesting things um, that we really won't get into a whole lot of detail on here just because it's not really kind of in scope for the conversation. But certainly, we want to talk about how we can optimize VXLAN for our, our, uh, our use. One of the main challenges that VXLAN solves, and I don't think I mentioned it, but certainly want to touch on it, is that it gives us 16 million logical segments. So for a lot of our customers, 4,000 VLANs just isn't enough, especially in a cloud environment or a multi-tenancy environment. How do I get beyond that 4,000 barrier? VXLAN helps solve that problem as well. So lots of good things with VXLAN that we wanted to take a, take a uh, look at. So obligatory frame format slide. Certainly the idea, as I mentioned earlier, it's an encapsulation technology. You all are very familiar with how networking works, probably more so than your average person. So we won't belabor this a ton. But the idea is I'm taking my, my original IP um, frame, or actually my, my layer two frame, wrapping it into VXLAN goodness and love, putting in an initial UDP header on it, a VXLAN header, and you can see the mappings for the fields. And I believe these slides will be available to you. So if you really want to dig into the detail, knock your socks off, right? That's, that's certainly there for you to, uh, to review. But it is an encapsulation and as such requires a larger than 1500 byte MTU, right? Roughly on order of magnitude of 1550 bytes is kind of the, the general guidance. Um, a lot of customers are starting to, to turn on jumbo frames just in general, 1600 bytes or all the way up to 92, 16 if their, their devices allow it, 9K, common value. So that, that's certainly a consideration for deploying the XLAN. When we look at the options that we have for being able to do some things to help virtualized systems scale and reduce the CPU workload for doing things like encapsulation, we start looking at some of the different NIC offloads that are available to us. And these are all different offloads that are available via the typical network uh, card manufacturers, right? So, so Intel, Broadcom, Emulex, Cisco, et cetera, 
kind of the household names from, from that space. But there are a number of them. One of them is TCP checksum offload, being able to let the, the NIC itself do that checksum calculation as opposed to the host CPU. Not terribly exciting, as well as large receive offload, being able to um, start to aggregate large TCP um, messages and then uh, being able to, to package them into a more efficient frame for delivery on the overall network. When we look at it from a standpoint of ones that we at VMware are are particularly interested in, specifically for VXLAN, we start looking at things like TCP segmentation offload, right? Being able to, to take a very large TCP message size and break it down into, to, um, into um, smaller frames, right? So being able to be able to, to offload that segmentation in the hardware, and then also receive side scaling. And receive side scaling is a technique that we'll talk about in a couple more slides with regards to being able to efficiently utilize all of the queuing mechanisms inside of a NIC. And when you start to think about how the software stack processes frames and how bits are placed on the wire, this becomes very important when you start looking at the way the different drivers and stuff work. So as I mentioned, these are the ones that we care about from a, v, from a VXLAN standpoint in particular. So we'll do a bit of a, of a lightweight packet walk. I, can barely call it a packet walk, but we're still inside the switch in this in this environment. We're inside the the, the host itself. So prior to any kind of offloading, um, what do we do? So the uh, the VM uh, sends its TCP frame to the distributed port group, and this is the the physical. I'm sorry, the uh, virtual NIC inside of the hypervisor itself. It's able to take advantage of TSO, right, TCP segmentation offload that we talked about earlier, and efficiently package it on the wire based on the MTU and send it on its merry way. Cool. This happens all day, every day. Really nothing magical or mystical. This is kind of a baseline, so please don't get too bored. We'll get, we'll get a little bit more exciting here in a couple more, couple more clicks. So certainly that allows us to be able to conserve CPU cycles. Customers buy CPUs and, and buy um, capacity to do their application workload, not to do networking, not to do other functions that are system-wide, but they're kind of a necessary, necessary requirement. So this is a bit way, a way to make it more efficient. Enter VXLAN encapsulation, and what, how does this picture change? Well, we have the exact same capability. Um, our VM sends a large TCP packet to the virtual NIC. The NIC receives it, but now it's being wrapped into VXLAN goodness and love. Well. What does that do for us? It's now a UDP packet, so that's different. What's the feature called? TSO, TCP segmentation offload. We now have a UDP frame. What do I do with it? Right now, <laughs> nothing, right? I, I can no longer do TCP segmentation offload to be able to optimize that flow at all because it's now wrapped in UDP. So from a NIC standpoint, it sees that IP header field and sees that, hey, this is UDP frame, not TCP frame. Skip it, move on to the next thing, right? The challenge is then that that puts all of those large TCP messages and their segmentation into the, back into the CPU. So now your CPU utilization goes back up just because of the virtue or because of the fact that you started to take advantage of VXLAN as a feature. Obviously, we don't want that. We want to be able to do cool things with it. So this is where your NIC vendor of choice has to be able to enable this feature. And, and in all fairness, we'll talk about this in a little bit, but Almost every NIC that's out there supports this. This isn't like a black magic voodoo feature that you can't only get on a handful of NICs and, and that's it. You're out of luck if you don't have those. These are pretty common feature sets. This has been around for quite a while. How many of you have ever done any kind of fiber channel over Ethernet, FCOE? Yeah, a handful. So similar kind of concept, right? Being able to leverage the, the hardware in the NIC itself to be able to do that, that kind of uh, encapsulation convergence for you. So again, our, with our large frame, it's sent and received by the physical, or by the, uh, the, the virtual NIC. Every packet still is a UDP frame, but by virtue of the driver having been enabled, we're able to do TSO on those VXLAN packets, right? So now we can be very efficient with how we package those data frames and put them on the network. Yay, life is good. We've improved performance. And we're reserving the CPU to do application things, right? As opposed to doing networking functions. So that's a very, very common feature. Typically, it's listed in the marketing slides as VXLAN offload. And it, as I mentioned, it's on almost every modern 10 gig NIC that's out there today. So, 
One of the things, this is, gets a, a little bit into the guts of, of vSphere itself. One of the components we use inside of vSphere to be able to leverage multiple cores across uh, the hypervisor is a feature called NetQueue. And the idea with NetQueue is I want it to be able to parse network data out to different cores of the processing power inside of the host so I can drive efficiency and utilization. I don't want to have everything pinned to one CPU, then I have only one, one CPU running all the, the traffic. The consideration though is that we utilize inside of NetQueue the MAC address that's assigned to the VM NICs. So that's important to know. Typically in a good network, MAC addresses are unique. Pretty straightforward. So the challenge though is that when we start looking at VXLAN encapsulation, we start to go to an endpoint. All the traffic between hosts that are VXLAN enabled goes between these concepts called VTAPs, VXLAN tunnel endpoints, right? And they are the same MAC address, or it's the same MAC address on, or it's, it's a single MAC address on a host itself, and that means that from a NetQ standpoint, I stick everything to the one queue. What do you think that does for performance? Not too great, right? So one of the things that we've done is we've implemented a feature called receive side scaling, and the, the attempt with receive side scaling is being able to see that, hey, this is destined for a VXLAN VTEP MAC address. I need to distribute it across multiple cores. So now I'm able to distribute that workload across everything, or across the, the multiple queues, and, um, and then have them be serviced by different cores in the hypervisor itself. So I'm able to drive better utilization without having to, uh, or, or better performance without having to increase my overall CPU utilization and have things bound to a single queue from a processing standpoint in the software stack. So the benefit certainly is the packet arrives at the default queue, it's inspected. If it's destined for VXLAN and VTAP, it gets distributed. If it's not, it gets sent to the default queue and processed single, single threadedly, right? So from that standpoint, this is a good thing that we want to be able to, uh, to have this, this distribution. Um, this is also a feature that takes advantage of capabilities within the, the NIC hardware itself, the physical adapter and does need to be enabled via the driver, right? So here's an example of uh, configuring receive side scaling. This is for, I think, a Broadcom NIC. And here's the CLI for those of you who, who want to play around with it in your environment. But the end result, and this doesn't show up that, that hot on this, this uh, screen, but you can see now that we have our receive packets being sent across multiple queues. Whereas prior to receive side scaling, they were all stuck to the first queue, right? They weren't being distributed evenly. So, this smooths the workload out across, across the, uh, the hypervisor. Just a quick note on inbox versus async drivers. Kind of the name makes sense, right? Inbox is whatever comes with vSphere when you download it, right? So that's the drivers that come with vSphere 5.5, 6.0, 5141, whatever floats your boat. Not all of them are enabled by default for taking advantage of VXLAN TSO or RSS. So, as always with networking, the devil's in the details. You need to do the research and figure out the NICs that I'm using in my hosts, are they enabled for these features with the drivers that come with vSphere when I download it and install it from, from VMware? Or do I need to contact my NIC manufacturer to get an updated driver? And in most cases, um, especially in the last probably two years, it's been you need to get an updated driver from the NIC manufacturer to, to enable those features. So it's something that you'll want to double check before you start looking at a large scale VXLAN deployment because you could end up with an underperforming environment just by virtue of not being able to take advantage of these hardware features that are latent in your environment, but because you have the wrong driver, you can't use them. So let's avoid that. Um, and then certainly as, as the drivers are tested, validated, QA'd, and we also package them with releases, we include them. So if you start looking at kind of just comparing vSphere 5.5 compared to vSphere 6, which is the current latest, newest, shiniest release, if you will, the, uh, the inbox drivers for vSphere 6 for most NICs already have these features enabled, whereas the ones for 5.5 and even 5.1 you had to go through and do a bit more work and load the async driver to get the appropriate version. So, as I mentioned, devil's in the details, but you know, as GI Joe says, knowing is half the battle, 
knowledge is power, all those good things, right? So you now know that if you start to deploy VXN, you'll want to take a look at this. So how do you prove to me that this, these actually do something? How many, anybody in here from Missouri? The show me state, there we go, see? We're gonna make you happy, we're gonna show you. All right, so from a test topology standpoint, here's what we've done to, to establish a baseline. And this is a little small, so I apologize for the folks that are further in the back, but again, you'll be able to have access to the slides. We had a test configuration cluster that we set up that had uh, eight virtual machines that were using NetPerf to be able to pump data back and forth to themselves and we could measure it. So our baseline was, let's set up these VMs and just put them into a traditional virtual distributed switch. No VXLAN, no fancy features, just vanilla, generic, kind of out of the box switching and take our baseline. That's kind of good testing methodology. And then the test under load, under duress was, okay, so now let's move to um, NSX and utilize VXLAN encapsulation and see what happens both before and after we enable these features. And primarily the, the traffic focus is east to west, right? And that's, that's the, uh, the focus here. Certainly there's more details on this that are, are shared in a, a broader, larger presentation, but given the constraints of time and the focus, we wanted to, to focus primarily on the logical switching, so east-west in this standpoint. So from a topology perspective, we had a couple different um, hosts that were part of it, comprised of eight different servers, and then we created our virtual networks across this, right? So and the reason we did this, and some customers look at it and say, wow, why would you have so many hosts and clusters and stuff? That seems like a little excessive. The idea is we wanted to be able to validate this in as close to kind of a real world scenario. These are, this is the design that we recommend for customers, right? This isn't just a, a testing, speed test, drag strip type of test like we did it and you'll never get to see those kind of results in your environment because your environment is different. This is what we recommend to our customers. This is a real world kind of eating your own dog food type of approach, right? So, so this is the deployment topology that we, we went with. We used IP perf, we won't go through all of the CLI knobs, but you can see that these are the commands that we use to be able to, uh, to test this for both TCP and UDP traffic. And, and then here's the methodology we use for our latency testing as well to collect the statistics, right? So not very real world from a standpoint of the transaction size, one bytes. I don't know how many of you have one byte transactions, probably not a lot, but certainly the, the premise is there to be able to have it um, validate the, the latency that's, that's part of this testing. So that aside, shut up and show me the results, right? Here's the results with our logical switching uh, test. We were able to see that we were able to uh, get roughly you know, 14 gigs of throughput at t small TCP message sizes, and then 1500 bytes and above, we were closer to 19 gigs, right? So for a dual NIC configuration with dual 10 gig NICs, darn near line rate with TSO and RSS enabled. So these, the numbers before that were significantly lower, right? They were around six gigs. So this is a pretty significant improvement just by having the right drivers that turn on the right nerd knobs inside of the NIC and take advantage of the hardware that you actually paid for, right? The feature's there, but if you don't use it, it doesn't do you much good. And then likewise, the, uh, the additional CPU uh, per gigabit based on TCP message size, in general, it's roughly 3%. And this is a question we get all the time. Okay, so if I'm having the CPU in my host do all this encapsulation, encapsulation, it, this group probably knows better than anybody, is intensive work, right? Whether it's IPsec encapsulation, whether it's any other encapsulation, anytime you're, you're sending packets back through the device, whether it's done in the hardware or software, is not a trivial matter. It takes CPU to do it, you gotta pay the piper somewhere. The, the good news is that with these features enabled, it's around 3%. So pretty moderate CPU hit, considering the, the additional benefits capabilities that you get by being able to move to a layer three fabric with VXLAN and not having to deal with the headache and heartache of large layer two domains. So, in summary, first off, you survived. So that's always a good thing. I didn't see anybody fall over dead. Not that that's happened, but it's always a, always a concern. You never know. But you certainly were able to drive close to line rate VXLAN traffic in vSphere, which is a good thing, considering that that's what we do. And then also, um, you were able to take advantage of TSO and RSS to be able to do these offloads in your NIC. And then, as always, the devil's in the details. Check with your NIC vendor 
to make sure that you're using the driver that has TSO and RSS enabled for vSphere so that you can be successful with this and not have an underperforming environment. With that, I guess yes. I'll open it for questions. So T, uh, TSO and RSS, you make sure you're part of the X lane. Um, how about IPv6? Have you guys got TSO and RSS for IPv6? And IPv6 encapsulated in the <laughs> So, so, so the, well, I guess I don't really need to repeat the question. That's the force of habit. Sorry. You actually used the microphone. Thank you. Um, from an from a IPv6 standpoint, today we don't have IPv6 support for VTEPs. So it is just an IPv4 topology. Um, we'll, we're looking at roadmap things to be able to, to enable that. And as long as the hardware will support it, we'd love to be able to take advantage of it. Okay. And then, what was, I'm sorry, the second part of your question. So that was kind of for the TSO and RSS. We, we, and then from a, from a VXLAN standpoint, we, we, you can run V6 inside of the VXLAN topology all day, every day. Okay. That's not a problem for us. Okay. But no support for V6 and TSO and RSS yet? Correct. Okay. Correct. Uh, so the VLAN, uh, is it better uh, or is it a better um, way of doing it? Would it be on the uh, hypervisor itself on the vSwitch or on the switch hardware? Best yeah, so best practice is going to be very variable. <laughs> but certainly, there, there's pros and cons, right? So from a, from a hardware standpoint, I used to work for a hardware manufacturer, love ASICs all day, every day. Used to carry them in my backpack, but now I don't need to, so. Um, there's benefits to having hardware switching, right? The um, consideration is that you have to be able to have something inside the hypervisor to be able to to extend those VNIs into the guests themselves, or the switch needs to know that, hey, this guest belongs to this particular VNI. Say that kind of bridging doesn't really work in all environments. We'll leave it at that. Um, certainly the, the benefits to the software is that we can extend it into the hypervisor and into the guest and get a lot more detail from the, the hypervisor uh, management system, in our case, vCenter being able to do pretty interesting rules and, and other attributes and things, um, but you also have the performance consideration to keep in mind. One of the things that we look at from a performance aspect though is that um, being able to do roughly 18 gigs, 18, 19 gigs per host is, is not bad. If it's a 20 gig host, I'm not giving away that much additional bandwidth. And typically what we see is that most of our hypervisor based customers are scaling out their workload, they're not buying necessarily a monster host to run hundreds of VMs, it's you know in the double digits. So it kind of maps out as you, as you scale out that it all works out. But again, it's, it's, it's the belly button principle, it depends on where you are, right? <laughs> if, I'm, if I only do hardware, then hardware is my preference. And from my standpoint, I only do software, so <laughs> software is my preference, but but it's up to you to make that decision. And it's important, I think, from a customer standpoint to be educated in the pros and cons. So in your test, you use the VDS. Does that mean that it's only available in VDS and not on VSS? So the, um, the, qu the quick answer is yes. The, 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 the feature, and I was trying to avoid really talking about the product just because I don't want to be like a sales droid, but the product we're talking about is NSX. And NSX relies on the VDS inside of vSphere to be able to, to do the underlying networking itself. So they, the quick answer is yes. It, 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 it doesn't work with the traditional VSS, the virtual standard switch. Not to be confused with VSS on the Cisco stuff I used to do a long time ago. <laughs> it's, it's the green model for acronyms. We recycle them in the networking industry all the time. Any other questions? If you do, my email is on the front of the presentation. It's Fuller R. I don't know why, but that's the way they gave me my email. Other people get cooler emails than I did. But thank you very much for the time. I really appreciate it. Great speaking with you. And <laughs>